Paul is explaining to the Romans the wonderful gospel of Christ, how by it God saves people. He changes people. And it's not by just setting a set of rules for them to live by. Rather, it is by grace through faith that we believe God and it is accounted to him for righteousness. Now some people struggle to understand how this actually works in practice and suggest that Paul is saying, well, we can sin as much as we like because God's grace will always cover our sin. But one way of thinking about it is the difference between a king and a father. A king sets rules, and you mightn't know all the rules that he set. So you will always be in fear of the king, because he has the power to destroy you. You will try very hard to please him, but you cannot be sure what side of the bed he got up in the morning, and whether he will be pleased or displeased. And that is like most religions. They set a standard of behaviour, they have certain obligations upon people, but you can never be sure whether you have adequately met those obligations. When we think of a father in a family though, and let me say this is an ideal family because there are many dysfunctional families around, the father also will set standards for the children. It's not his arbitrariness that sets the standards, it's so that the children will develop to be like him. Sometimes the children will not meet those standards and he might get very cross with the children. He does not kill them. He forgives them and encourages them to have another go, to try again. When a child is beginning to walk, you don't give up on them every time they trip over, but you console them if they're hurt, and for a while you hold their hand till they regain their confidence. And the love of a father and a mother to a child means that whatever happens, However many times the child fails, the parent will continue to encourage the child to do that which is right and good. And this is what happens when we become children of God. We receive the Spirit of God. And so God's approach to us is no longer that we should be judged and condemned, but rather as children. When we fail, he encourages us to have another go at doing that which is right. Paul's explaining this concept in Romans chapter 6. And he says, If we died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin, and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness, and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, in Christ Jesus 
our Lord. My name's Arthur and I thank you for joining me as we share these words together. What Paul is basically saying is that if you have believed the gospel, then live out on the basis of the gospel. You were a slave of sin and the result of that was that you were destined to death. But Jesus has died for you and risen again. So when you believe in Jesus, your death is past and you only look forward to life. Therefore, you should present your bodies, your life, to God to live for righteousness and no longer feel bound to the body for sin. The reality of your salvation, when you get up each morning, who do you present yourself to, to live for the day? Do I present myself to God, that I might do those things that honour him and please him? Or do I present myself to sin, that I might please myself and honour myself. That's the test that we can apply to ascertain whether we truly are a believer. Because you belong to the master that you serve. If you serve the flesh, then he is your master. If you serve God, then he is your master. The slave gets up in the morning and looks to his master to see what the master would have him do that day. So whose slave are you? Paul says to the Roman Christians he's writing to, God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. He explains this in human terms. This is an an analogy, a parallel, a way of people at that generation understanding the difference between being saved and not being saved. For slavery was widespread. There was no social welfare system. If you got into debt, then you had to find someone who would pay off your debt and take you on as their responsibility. You became their slave to do whatever they wanted. People at all levels of society were slaves, owned by others, but some of them, like we read in the Old Testament concerning Joseph, was a very sophisticated slave who was ruling a whole house. Nevertheless, his status was as a slave. He'd been purchased. He was not free to leave the job and go and get another one if he didn't like it. So, for us, we are not free to leave the slavery of sin except by the one opportunity that is given to us through faith in Jesus Christ. And if we obey that form of doctrine, whereby we acknowledge that our sin was laid upon the Lord Jesus and he has redeemed us from that master, sin, that we might be his servants. For when one slave is purchased by another slave owner, the person then is responsible to be a slave of the new purchaser. Christ has purchased us with his blood that we might be slaves of righteousness. So, we should present our members, that is our body, as slaves of righteousness for holiness. We were slaves of sin. We're ashamed of the things that we did, our self-centeredness, our greed. The end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have the fruit of holiness and the end, everlasting life. Because we've been set free from sin, we can now do things for God, which will bring glory to God, and he will reward those good things in eternity. Of course, if we do not present ourselves to God to serve him in this life, when we are believers in Jesus, then we will receive eternal life, but we will have no fruit to show for our lives. And Paul would like us to have the fruit of holiness as well as eternal life. So, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you obey its lusts. Present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion. It shall not have the final say. You are not under law, but under grace.